Hi, I'm Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. This is Therapeutic Update. Today we're going to discuss the August 2nd Arthritis Advisory Committee meeting, wherein the FDA reviewed the safety of serucumab, an IL-6 inhibitor um, submitted by Janssen for approval. Uh, I'm going to discuss this meeting by asking an expert. I have with me Dr. Alan Gabowski, who is a professor of medicine at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York and Weill Cornell Medicine. Uh, Alan is a past chair of the FDA Advisory Committee. He and I sat in, sat in on meetings in the past. He has a great deal of experience with regard to how these meetings are run and what to take from them. So I've asked him to come on here and take five questions about the meeting. Alan, welcome. Thank you, Jack. Good to be with you tonight. Alan, first question, what's your overall impression of the meeting that occurred on August the 2nd, wherein they, both the FDA and the sponsor presented great data on efficacy and on x-ray outcomes, but everybody had a problem with safety. Well, Jack, I think it's important to remember that the FDA's charge is to evaluate the safety and efficacy of medication. Their charge is to be certain that safe and efficacious medications come to market. And as such, whenever there is an issue related to safety, the FDA is likely to be more conservative than proponents of efficacy would like them to be. I think it's particularly of concern when the agent that's being evaluated is yet another agent in a class that's already available. Now, I understand that there are distinctions that can be drawn within the class of IL-6 inhibitors, but that may well turn out to be a distinction without a difference. And I think that was what prompted the FDA to hold an advisory committee in order to get advice as to whether the issues related to the safety of the drug that was revealed in the clinical trials overweighed the issues related to the efficacy. So my overall impression was that the advisory committee did its job in reviewing the safety and considering the safety in light of the efficacy. So a big issue that did come up at the meeting is what you brought up, that this would, be the, this would have been the third IL-6 inhibitor that might come to market. And easy for them that they already had two on the market, and this big safety concern that they grappled with was reason enough to not stretch it to a third. But let me flip the table. You know, we have five TNF inhibitors, certainly the first three, and maybe the next, the next two grew the market, um, had more people were served, more people... Uh, uh, were treated with more aggressively. There's a, a value to having um, more Me Too drugs. So, uh, is this a real loss, or um, is this? Uh, are we okay with uh, doing that without a third IL-6 inhibitor? Well, um, I don't know, Jack. Uh, obviously, the committee was itself concerned that are they denying the opportunity for an efficacious medicine because of concerns about safety in a cohort, which would deprive an individual of getting a medication they may respond to. But on balance, that is the charge of the committee and that is the charge of the FDA, particularly when you're looking at another drug in a class. Now, um, I think David Felsen did the best analysis I've seen when he asked the question, putting aside the safety, what is the likelihood of marginal incremental benefit to the class of individuals who were tested, i.e. DMARD IR and TNF IR. And by David's superb analysis, it did not look like the possibility of marginal efficacy, i.e. achieving an ACR20, overweighed the concerns about safety for this third drug in the class. Certainly the FDA is not going to deny an agent to market merely because there are others in that class. Indeed, we saw that the second IL-6 inhibitor was approved without a panel. But where there are concerns about safety, that's where the FDA will ask for advice and where they got advice in this particular instance. So one of the big issues in this meeting was the placebo-controlled study. And, and actually, it was the placebo-controlled patients who had an early exit possibility. And when they crossed over, they happened to be the patients who had the greatest degree of safety signals, including an imbalance in deaths, leading the panelists to say, do we need placebo-controlled trials anymore? 
So what's your opinion? I mean, these used to be the benchmark of FDA trials. Are these now a dinosaur? I think there's some real concerns about letting rheumatoid arthritis go un or under treated. And that may be a primary rationale for reducing the length of time of a placebo controlled trial or abandoning it entirely. I'm not so sure that abandoning a placebo controlled trial will only be the result of seeing more adverse events in a crossover population. There are reasons for people not to go untreated for long periods of time, i.e. increasing the inflammatory burden by un or under treatment. So to your, your question, yes, I think placebo controlled trials are problematic unless the placebo is some active comparator against which the drug is being tested. So since safety was the big issue here, how did you handle issues of safety in clinical drug development trials that were powered for efficacy and not for safety? You know, we certainly know about you know, the sniffles and nausea, vomiting, common things, but the ones that everyone's concerned about, including deaths, like we're seeing in this study, or major uh, cardiac events, um, those are empowered. And, and so what's your threshold or what's the panelist's threshold for handling safety issues in trials powered to look at efficacy? I think you're absolutely right. No efficacy trial is ever powered for safety. Because if you power a trial for safety, you need several hundred, if not thousands of patients in order to detect a rare event. At best, your efficacy trials can give you the possibility of a signal. It may not even give you the signal. The signal may not be seen until post-marketing occurs after drug approval. But in some instances, you get either lucky or unlucky that you do see something during an efficacy trial. And when there is a significant imbalance, particularly with regard to mortality, this is where the FDA really has concerns. So you're right, you know, um, this was bad luck to some extent. Had they done a different population or um, different studies, they might not have seen these signals occurring, in which case it might not have been seen until the post-marketing effort. You and I have lived through drugs that have come on the market in our field only to be pulled because of post-marketing effects that were not seen during safety, uh, efficacy trials. So this was in some ways a blessing. Lastly, uh, as one who ran panels and participated in many panels, um, what's your take on the uh, membership of the arthritis advisory panels? Uh, this particular group was 13 strong voting members and it included pediatric and adult rheumatologists and um, two patient representatives and a epidemiologist and a pharmacologist and an NIH doctor or two. And, and what's lacking there is uh, around the table is a strong representation of people who do clinical trials or a big name rheumatoid or IL-6 people. Um, you know, there are certainly some notable leaders. Dan Solomon, very strong in FE, was the chair. And as you said, David Felsen was on the committee. Uh, Mike Weissman was on the committee. But there's a lot of regular docs on that committee, too. Um, is this the right representation for these kind of hearings? It's always problematic to bring together a panel that has the perfect representation. What struck me was that many of the people whom we saw yesterday were really ad hocing because many of the designated members weren't participating. Whether that was because of scheduling in their personal lives, whether that was because of recusal during the conflicts, I don't know but one often finds that the composition of a panel might not be ideal from the trialist's perspective, but it is certainly representative from the community's perspective in terms of including an industry representative, a consumer representative, appropriate basic scientists, appropriate clinicians, and uh, individuals who are epidemiologists and statisticians. So is a panel going to be perfect? Probably not. Is it going to be representative such that an approach to solving and resolving the question to ask can occur? Yes. Alan, very instructive as always. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jack. Been a pleasure.